But first, President Trump hosted South Korea's new president at the White House today, the first meeting between the two leaders who were looking for a common approach to dealing with North Korea. William Brangham has that. President Moon Jae-in arrived at the White House with tensions over North Korea still running high. In the Rose Garden, President Trump pressed again for ending the North's nuclear and weapons programs. The era of strategic patience with the North Korean regime has failed. Many years, and it's failed. And frankly, that patience is over. We're working closely with South Korea and Japan, as well as partners around the world, on a range of diplomatic, security, and economic measures to protect our allies and our own citizens from this menace known as North Korea. North Korea, led by Kim Jong-un, has already test-launched more than a dozen missiles this year, all in defiance of international sanctions. South Korean President Moon has long advocated for diplomatic engagement with the North. And since taking office just last month, he's delayed full deployment of the U.S.'s THAAD anti-missile defense system in his country. Today, though, he warned of a stern response to any provocations. The North Korean nuclear issue must be resolved without fail. I also urge Pyongyang to promptly return to the negotiating table for denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. President Trump and I will employ both sanctions and dialogue in a phased and comprehensive approach. And based on this, we both pledge to seek a fundamental resolution of the North Korean nuclear problem. Meanwhile, the U.S. has sought China's help to try and rein in North Korea. However, yesterday, the administration announced sanctions against Chinese companies and individuals over their alleged illicit dealings with North Korea. But U.S. officials insisted they weren't targeting the Chinese government. Today, neither President Trump nor President Moon mentioned China. On a different subject, Mr. Trump again criticized the U.S. trade deficit with South Korea and blamed a 2011 free trade deal for the imbalance. He called for new action to reduce trade barriers between the two countries. For his part, Moon played down the trade issue, and he announced that the president and Mrs. Trump have accepted his invitation to visit South Korea later this year. So where do things stand between the U.S. and South Korea, and how will the two nations deal with the North? For that, we turn to Robert Gallucci. He was the chief U.S. negotiator back in 1994 when the Clinton administration persuaded the North Koreans to dismantle their plutonium-based nuclear program in exchange for economic benefits. He's now a professor at Georgetown University and chair of the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome to the News Hour. Thank you very much. Do you think today's meeting between Moon and Trump will help forge a clearer plan for how to deal with North Korea? I think today's meeting is a, a success in the sense that the United States and the South Koreans clearly uh, indicated that they value the alliance very much, and the alliance is important to uh, the security of both our countries and the stability of Northeast Asia. Um, the way you frame that question, that it's going to lead to the resolution of the issue with North Korea, is a bit of a reach from uh, at least what I could take away from the meeting. You and several other former cabinet officials and senators wrote a letter to the Trump administration where you urged that they take uh, direct, immediate talks with the North Koreans, possibly send a high-ranking envoy to North Korea. Why do you think that that's a good idea? Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think that people who favor negotiations do so partly because the alternatives are miserable. There are fundamentally three options in dealing with North Korea, and there always have been since the end of the Korean War. Uh, one is to contain the North Koreans, and we've been doing that, we've done it for decades, and we've been doing that actually for the uh, eight years of the Obama administration. I'd say that was a containment or strategic patience type of policy. Uh, the problem with containment is that it doesn't stop the North Koreans from developing assets and capabilities and threat that we would rather they not have. So a second option uh, is to negotiate and to see whether they, we cannot reach an agreement with the North Koreans where they agree to give up a capability which we believe they should not have and is threatening to friends and allies. That's what we attempted to do in 1994 with the agreed framework. 
Uh, a third option is to use military force, something which we are proud to always to say is on the table, uh, something we haven't done. And by that, we do not mean launching another Korean War. We mean the use of military force in some limited way to attack the capability. Right now, it's not only the nuclear weapons, but it's those long-range ICBM-range ballistic missiles. In your letter, though, you're clearly arguing for point two negotiation. And there are some people, as you well know, in the foreign policy establishment who say you cannot negotiate with the North Koreans. And I'm just curious how you respond to that. Yeah, I think it's a fair, th a fair thing to say that negotiations with the North Koreans are not guaranteed to succeed. And certainly the, through the years of the Bush administration, Bush 43, the 2000s, there are many efforts by very capable people to negotiate with the North Koreans and that did not produce very much. And even the agreement which stuck for eight years, the agreed framework I mentioned before, stuck for a while and stopped the plutonium program from producing nuclear weapons. Ultimately, it collapsed as well. So that there's reason to say that negotiations with the North Koreans are not easy. They may not succeed, but they may be a way of getting to where we want to get to, limiting that capability of the North Koreans to do harm to us and our allies without the use of military force and without the risk of a major war in Northeast Asia. The Chinese have floated another possible entreaty to the North Koreans, and that's for the U.S. and the South Koreans to stop these annual military exercises. How important is that to the North Koreans, and do you think that that's a good idea? North Koreans have said uh, frequently that they are very unhappy about the U.S. ROK uh, military exercises. Uh, and I do believe they are unhappy about them. You, you actually kn had some recent meetings with North Korean officials and you heard this very same issue raised. It was the first thing on their agenda that they were most concerned about. Uh, what's interesting about that, of course, is that from our perspective, the alliance between the United States and the Republic of Korea is key to both our country's security and a manifestation of the strength of that alliance are those military exercises. So that will not be high on our agenda to give up easily. Is that something that might be on the table along with the nuclear weapons program of the North Koreans? Plausibly, but that's pretty much down the road. I wouldn't imagine that negotiations would begin there. They'd begin with talks about talks, I think, without preconditions. Um, lastly, do you think the Trump administration has any interest in any of the things you're talking about? I don't know uh, what the Trump administration is interested in. There have been mentions uh, by uh, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and even by the President of possibly talking with the North Koreans. I worry that they, in their minds are preconditions that will make negotiations someplace between difficult and impossible. Robert Gallucci, Georgetown University, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much.